Spirit of the living God, we come before you, Jesus. We thank you for your grace, Lord. And yes, to glorify your name. And uh, Lord, uh, you are just so good. And Lord, we ask to be filled with your spirit, to be edified, of course, to be convicted, challenged, and changed. And so, Lord, uh, please be with me and remove me as we get into this new word, or your word that's always new and good. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are in the book of Galatians. Um, so the book of Galatians, yeah, we are, uh, this is called God's grace, God's glory. And we'll be looking at Galatians, uh, the introduction and then verses one through four. So, um, we have been in the old Testament for a while. And God kind of gave me a, a uh, what is it, a schedule, a pattern, a, an agenda of the books that we were supposed to be doing. And so far, we're on target with that order. So, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's definitely a big switch for, for me um, going from Hebrew narrative to Greek doctrine. And I just want to tell you guys this. Okay, so you know we have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, which is considered the Holy Spirit's Gospel. Then we have the letters um, from 1 Corinthians to Jude, and then Revelation is a different kind of book. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, they're not doctrinal books. And what I mean by doctrinal books is, yes, it's the Bible, but it's not teaching you how to walk out this Christian life. The letters from 1 Corinthians to Jude are doctrinal. They're, they're not a narrative. They're not telling you a story. They're telling you how to live this. So it's a lot different, right? Um in the Gospels, in the Old Testament, even in Revelation, there is some doctrine, but it's not doctrinal. I hope that makes sense to you. All right, so Galatians. As an introduction to our new book, the book of Galatians, my introduction to this book is going to be woven throughout the book instead of me giving you a complete overview from the beginning. Okay. Why did it come out that way? Because I don't know why. <laughs> it just did. It's just, just the way God is putting it together. Anyway, so the geographical uh, region of Galatia is in Asia Minor, which is today modern day Turkey. Okay, now in ancient times, the Galatians were both an ethnic group of people and later a geographical province of people. Kind of like, I think if we today, we would say there are Americans and Native Americans. Does that make sense? So if you're saying Americans, you could be specifically talking about Native Americans or you could be talking about Americans as a whole. All right, so... Um, as an ethnic group of people, the Galatians were known as the Gauls or the Celtics. Um, in the fourth century before Christ, the Gauls actually raided and sacked Rome. And then a couple of hundred years later, after the death of Alexander the Great, they actually conquered some Greek cities. In the Ancient writings, the Gauls or the Celtics, um, they were described as tall in stature, having long red hair, um, and their physical characteristics were married to their wild behavior in battle, which made them terrifying and, uh, and appalling. Mm. The Celtic tribes of Britain, France, 
Germany were all Gauls and they originated from Central Asia after having migrated there and then they went back to Europe. Okay. So they were celebrated by different people that will hire them because of their size and their fierceness. They were they were like wild and hot headed and ruled by animal passions. <laughs> So to the Greeks, because the Greeks were logical thinking people, they made them, le to the Greeks, they were less than rational. Um, in classical civilizations of ancient history, they painted the Celts as savage warrior people who were uncivilized and simple in their animal passions. To the Greeks and the Romans, they were considered barbarians because to the Greeks and Romans, anybody who wasn't culturally Greek they were and tribal, you were a barbarian. Barbarian didn't necessarily mean savage. It just meant you weren't sophisticated, right? So basically, the barbarians were the people who lived in the hood. <laughs> if, if, does it make sense to you? They were the uncultured people of society. <laughs> so, as far as the Romans were concerned, Gauls were Gauls no matter where they were in the world, and they were barbarians. Now, the Galatians as a whole, the geographical group of people and the specific people, uh, they were fickle and wishy-washy. Mm. Their commitments and resolve stood strong, that is, until the next shiny object presented itself with a promise of greener grass on the other side. Oh, they were impulsive and emotional. Mm. They were intelligent, quick, and witty, but also they were highly impressionable, and easily influenced, and they were fond of change. They changed without thinking things through. They would passionately jump into something and then get bored or discontent with it and then change the channel. For example, in Acts 14, the first time Paul went deeper into Galatia with Barnabas, they were in a city called Iconium. And the unbelieving Jews ran them out of that city, so Paul and Barnabas went to another city called Lystra. When they got there, God used Paul to heal a paralyzed man. So the people started celebrating and shouting, the gods have come down in the likeness of men, and Barnabas they called Zeus. And Paul, they call Hermes, and they gathered everybody together so that they could worship Paul and Barnabas by sacrificing a bull to them. Then Paul stopped them and was able to point them to Christ. But after a few days, the unbelieving Jews showed up and convinced the people that Paul was evil, so they stoned him. So one day they wanted to worship him, the next day they stoned him. <laughs> After they stoned them, Paul got up and went right back into the city and continued preaching. Then the next day, Paul and his crew went all around Galatia to different cities, establishing churches and appointing elder, elders in different churches that they planted. Mm -hmm. Then they returned home to their home church in Antioch. Now, Antioch was also in Galatia, but it was way down south. So it was like on the border and it was kind of knew because it was a Roman, it was uh, Antioch. As far as the churches go in the first century, there was the church of, in Jerusalem, and then there was the church in Antioch. Both of them were big, major churches. Does that make sense? Okay. So Paul's home church was in Jerusalem. It was Antioch. Anyway, so they returned home to Antioch. Now, at the time this happened, um, it was their first missionary trip. It was 
probably, and I think it was, between Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 15. See, in Acts chapter 15 is when the church had its very first council, and that was to understand how do these Gentiles fit into being Christians, right? Without converting to Judaism and out without having to keep the law after they become believers. So if Galatians was written prior to Acts 15, Paul would have mentioned it in this letter to the Galatians. He would have gave the council's um, judgment on salvation, but he doesn't mention it in the book of Galatians. So is that making sense? Okay. Now, the church council leaders, apostles, agreed with Jesus, of course, and Paul's teaching that we're saved by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone. Not only are we saved by grace, we are kept saved by grace and not by any works of our own. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Saved by grace and the just are the ones who are saved shall live by faith. That's the core argument of this letter, mm -hmm. right? So the saved are the just. And since we are the just, we're saved and made right by God, with God, by grace, but we're also kept saved by God's grace. Mm -hmm. So what happened was after Paul planted and strengthened all these new churches in Galatia, the Judaizers came behind him after he left and taught these new disciples that grace was not enough to be saved and live righteous. What they were saying was, in order to truly be a Christian, you have to get circumcised, keep the law, celebrate all the Jewish feasts, and then you'll be saved the right way. But they also brought into question and challenged Paul's authority as a genuine apostle. All right. So that's kind of like what's going on. And like I said, we'll go through more of the overview as we go through the book. So verse one, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Okay, so the word apostle means the one who uh, one who is sent. Now remember, these Judaizers are challenging Paul's authority as an, agost, as an apostle. And in the technical sense of the word, every believer in Christ is called to be an apostle because we have been sent by Jesus in the power and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the whole world and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a disciple is a believer and follower of, of Christ, mm -hmm. but an apostle is one who is now sent out to make disciples and believers of Christ. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so we have all technically been called to be apostles. But there's a difference in the office of an apostle. The office of apostleship was only during the first century. Um, these men were set apart with the authority to speak new revelations directly from God. And some were given authority to write the scriptures of the New Testament. Okay. Our faith in God and our knowledge of Jesus as our Savior and the establishment of the church and the entire family of believers from Adam till today is known by God's special revelation to humankind and written in the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, but is written and built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Okay? Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, Paul is dealing with this issue of his apostleship. See, everybody knew the original 12 apostles were chosen and handpicked by Jesus. 
They had served with the Lord during his earthly ministry and saw him after he rose from the dead. Now, after Judas died, the remaining 11 apostles chose Matthias to replace Judas. His apostleship came from man. That's not saying he wasn't the right choice, and it's not saying he wasn't a true apostle, but it's saying men who were apostles ordained him to be an apostle. In Acts 14, Barnabas is called an apostle. All of Jesus' brothers were called apostles. Apollo, Silas, and Luke and Titus are also referred to as apostles. And Luke wrote two books in the New Testament. Some apostles were appointed by Jesus. Others were ordained or confirmed to be an apostle by man or through man. So Paul is saying from the start, my appointment to the office of an apostle came directly from God the Father through Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. See, in Acts 9, when Paul got saved on a road to Damascus, Jesus literally knocked him to the ground and blinded him. And then after Paul supernaturally met Jesus, he was in shock. He was blind and he was in somebody's house praying. So Jesus had to go speak to another believer named Ananias and told him, go pray for Paul. And Ananias was like, uh, Lord, are you sure you got the right dude? Right? And in Acts 9, 13, Ananias said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he is here and he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But check this out. The Lord Jesus said to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay, that part right there to me is chilling. <laughs> if Jesus saved you on the day he saved you and told you, okay, so now this is what's going to happen now that you're with me. And you'd be like, okay, let me, how, let me try to work this out with my sin. <laughs> Paul, in recounting his conversion in Acts 26, 15, he said, After Jesus knocked me down in the brightness of his glory, blinded me, I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen, and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified, that is set apart by, for me by by faith in me. Jesus personally handpicked Paul and told him, Paul, you're a chosen vessel of mine. I've made you a minister. I've made you a witness, both of the things which you have already seen and of the things that I will reveal to you. So go to the Jewish people, to the Gentiles, whom I am sending you, you can't get more appointed directly and divinely by God than that. Now, today the world is full of false, false apostles and false prophets. Today when you hear someone claiming to be an apostle or prophet, what they are claiming to be is to have the same authority as Moses, as Elijah, Jeremiah, Paul, John, or Luke. In other words, what they're saying is just like God spoke to every prophet writing in the Bible, he's also speaking to me. 
Therefore, even though we have Genesis to Revelation, God isn't finished writing the Bible. In other words, they're saying everything that they say is equal to Scripture, and they need to be obeyed like the Scripture. Because their revelations are new and directly from God, even when their revelations contradict the scriptures. So let me explain this. Some Christians believe God has stopped speaking and stopped working supernaturally. But the truth is God is still speaking and he's still acting supernaturally. Amen. But God is not speaking new revelations to people. He speaks fresh revelations to people, but nothing he speaks contradicts what's already written in the Bible. Amen. See, the difference between new revelation and fresh revelation is this. New revelation would be something never given by God and now needs to be added to the Bible. Fresh revelation is God opening the scriptures to you with a deeper and renewed understanding, but it's not anything new. It's not anything contradictory, nor has anything changed from what is already written in the Bible. Okay, so if I was to talk about new and fresh revelation... This is a pen, right? Everybody knows this is a pen. And if you unscrew it, you know there's a spring in there and all that, right? You know that. But if I took you to the metallurgist and he told you the compounds to make the spring, and then the inkologist, if that's a person, the inkologist tells you how they made the ink, and the plastic technician, the person that tells you, if they told you all of these details, that would be fresh revelation. Right. It's not anything new. It's just deeper of what's already there. Is that, you understand the difference between fresh revelation and new revelation? Okay, so people that don't believe God is still speaking say that he's not speaking. But God is still speaking. He's speaking fresh revelation. God does also speak to us a word for other people personally. But it's not something for the whole church, nor will it be anything that ever contradicts the scripture. Right? So God is not telling you that you need to be a stripper and write rap music because it will bless him. <laughs> right? That's not new revelation. That's a lie. That's not even fresh revelation. That's made up. He's not going to say anything that's not already in his word. Does that make sense? Okay. But in those cases, if someone has a word for you, or you believe the word, the Lord has given you a word for somebody. Um, 1 Corinthians 14.3 4, states, he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So if someone is giving you a prophecy, it is edification, exhortation, and comfort. Just because somebody says they have a word from the Lord does not mean what they say is from the Lord. So 1 John 1, 4 instructs us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. Okay, now, today, um, leaders in the church, such as pastors, come into ministry by different means. The first 
are those who have been gifted and called by God and then appointed or ordained to the ministry by men who simply recognize God has gifted this man as a pastor and chosen him for the office of elder or bishop. Is that making sense? Yeah. But there's another class of spiritual leaders who claim their authority comes through apostolic uh, succession. So people like the popes and those uh, denominations that wear collars, right? Their leaders in this class claim that an apostle laid hands on somebody who in turn laid hands on somebody and they laid hands on somebody else on down through history until hands were laid on them. So this is apostolic secession. Does that make sense? I'm an apostle because so-and-so was an apostle, because so-and-so was an apostle, because so-and-so was an apostle, because some apostle way back at Jesus' times touched him, and it's all come down. Okay. Is that making sense? Yes. All right. There are those who get their commission or ordination not from God, but from men. For example, in many de denominations, the things that qualifies a person uh to be a pastor in the ministry is a master degree containing two years of Greek and a year of Hebrew. But being saved is not a requirement. Education is. For some, uh, in this man, not God approved uh, 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 appointment, education may not be a requirement as long as the person is dynamic. They're engaging and motivating. Another class are those who are self-appointed. Their authority doesn't come from God or through men. They just simply self-proclaim themselves as spiritual leaders. Then they make you drink Kool-Aid. Or go on a rocket. Now, there's a scholarly debate, and I'm just kind of putting this in here just in case you run across it, which really doesn't matter. But the debate is uh, whether Paul was writing to Northern Galatia, Southern Galatia, the ethnic Galatians, or every believer in Christ within the entire geographical area of Galatia. But it seems to me that he answered it in his greeting when he said, to the churches of Galatia. <laughs> anyway. Verse 3. To the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, grace and peace are a combination of both Greek and Hebrew greetings. Um, grace is from the Greek mindset, meaning loving kindness, favor, and goodwill be bestowed upon you. Peace, or shalom, is from the Hebrew meaning, uh, uh, meaning reconciliation, tranquility, safety, and soundness. Free from contention, danger, strife, and stress. However, this greeting of grace and peace is deeper than the natural or human horizontal level of things. This greeting is on a spiritual level, vertically, from God down to man. And it must always flow in this order, grace and then peace. See, we cannot have peace with God, the peace of God, and peace from God without first having received the grace of God. Amen. See, grace is getting the goodness of God, which we do not deserve. Grace is receiving that which benefits us and draws us closer to God. Meaning, grace may or may not always feel good. We like to think the grace of God is always, oh, right? 
But grace could be a bad doctor's report that puts you on your knees. Grace is good because God knows what we need to get closer. Grace is that which justifies us and puts us in a right standing with God. It's the grace of God that saves us and it's the grace of God that keeps us saved. Grace. Our God's peace is the tranquil state of our soul that assures us of our salvation through Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of grace, we have nothing to fear from God. Grace also means to be content with thanksgiving in whatever season or state of life God has you in. Now, the peace of God means when you receive God's gracious gift of salvation, you're no longer an enemy of God. You're no longer an enemy of God fighting the losing war against God. And why? Because you have been born again and have become an eternal child of God. The peace of God means that God stooped down to bring you near. Therefore, the peace received does not come from anyone, but it comes down to us from God himself. The peace of God guards our hearts and minds from distress and hopelessness. The peace of God tells us we're not crushed, we're not forsaken, and we're not destroyed. When our whole world is turned upside down and inside out, the peace of God causes us to rejoice in hope. Because the peace of God surpasses all understanding. So, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. To you, grace and peace. Now, check this out. In every letter Paul wrote to the churches, he always greeted them with grace and peace and he addressed them as saints. In Romans 1, 7, he said, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3, Paul wrote, To the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on upon the name of the Lord Jesus, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2, he writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in Achaia, grace and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the church of Ephesus, in Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. In Philippians 1 and 2, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints, in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1, 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The only church Paul did not address in his greeting as saints was the Thessalonians, but he did praise them and express his love for them and call them saints within those letters. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2, he says, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. We give thanks to God always for you, um, 
so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And in the second Thessalonians, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. When he comes in that day, be glorified in his saints and be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Grace, mercy, peace, saints. But when it came to the Galatians, they had ticked Paul off so much, he didn't call them saints. He didn't even use the word saint one time in the entire letter. Instead of calling them saints or set apart from God, Paul asked them, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? <laughs> Galatians is about the grace of God. And grace is the one thing our human nature hates. And as believers, along with God's love, God's mercy, God's peace, God's grace is one of the most hardest things we struggle to receive continually. Most people will not go to heaven because they believe them they believe in themselves and their pride tells them they are not bad enough for heaven. In fact, their pride twists it and tells them that they're good enough for heaven. And since they're good enough for heaven, they don't need Jesus as their savior to get there. However, for those of us who realize that we are hopelessly bad enough to go to heaven, we turn to Jesus and receive his love and got saved by his grace. So why did he save us? Why is his grace so important? Ephesians 2, 7 through 9 tells us. Now, everybody knows, for by grace you have been saved through faith, right? You guys know that. But that's Ephesians 2, 8. Ephesians 2, 7 says this, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding richness of his grace and his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of your works, so nobody can boast. In other words, nobody's going to be looking at the person next to him in heaven and be like, I got here because I did this. What did you do? I made the team. Look at God up there on the throne. So glad I'm here. Wow. <laughs> grace is a blow to our pride the book of Galatians deals a death blow over and over to man's greatest sin and abomination to God the sin of pride now here is the grace of God Jesus Christ verse 4 gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God the Father loved us so much that he gave his son to take away our sins. Yet the son himself loved us so much that he gave himself for our sins. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this than to lay, lay down one's life for his friends. He didn't give himself for our sins because we deserved it. 
He did it because of his love, because of his grace. In other words, the, if the Lord would not have given himself and died in our place to take the punishment for our sins, our sins would have taken us to hell Absolutely. because there is no way we could remove them. Therefore, Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Now, that word deliver, it means to pluck out and to rescue. But check this out. It's in the middle voice, meaning that he didn't do it for our sake. He came and died on the cross for our sins for his own sake. In Isaiah 43, 25, it says, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God did not save you for you. He did it for him. But there's more behind the idea of this word deliver. Um. The ideal behind the word deliver is not deliverance from the presence of our sins and this present evil state of the world, but deliverance from the power of our sins and this present evil state of the world. In other words, this deliverance has given us, the, given us power over the power that keeps us in bondage. We won't be delivered or rescued from the presence of sin until we leave this world and go be with Jesus. But now we can experience the deliverance from the power of this present evil age right now. The Lord rescued us from ourselves and then from all that's in the world. That is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Jesus came to rescue us from the power and bondage of the ruler of this world. That's the prince of the power of the air called the devil. In John 3, 8, it states, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He gave himself to deliver us from our sins and this present evil age. The purpose of Christ's coming to save us was not primarily about us, although we benefit beyond imagination. He came because it was the will of the Father, and Jesus always does the will of the Father. It was for the glory of God. Now, of all the things that God gives us, like faith, hope, peace, and mercy, and of all the things he shares with us, like love, forgiveness, truth, and grace, the one thing the Lord does not give us and does not share is his glory. In Isaiah 48, 9, the Lord says, For my name's sake, I will defer my anger, and for my praise, I will restrain it from you, so I do not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake, and for my own sake, I will do it. For why should my name be profane, and I will not give my glory to another? So grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he could deliver us, rescue us, snatch us out from the power of this present evil age and our own sins for the will of God and to the glory of God. See, it's not about us. It's all about God's grace and God's glory. Amen? Amen? 
Lord, we thank you so much that none of this has anything to do with us and that we have nothing to contribute. Lord, we ask that you help us not to be fickle and chain, channel changers like the Galatians. Yes. But that we would learn to rejoice in your grace. Amen. That we would learn to glorify you. And for anyone... Um, who doesn't know Jesus and you are aware that the Lord is calling you and you would like to become a child of God, just say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you gave yourself for me, died in my place for my sins on the cross. I believe you rose again on the third day Please forgive me for my sins and accept me as your child. If you said that prayer and believe it in your heart, you are now a child of God. And there is a party going on in heaven for you. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We glorify you. We magnify you. In your holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Amen.